All right, so let me ask you a question. How many, how many of you will be so brave as to admit that just a little bit over a year ago that you watched the live birth of a giraffe? Anybody here? You know what I'm talking about. Ladies, raise your hand. Come on, come on. You're just kind of doing this. Yeah, my wife was glued to the television or to the uh, internet. Uh, it, it started about two months before the actual event. She would say, I would say, what are you watching? And she would say, there's a, a giraffe gonna have a baby. Well, they have babies every day. But no, this is in a zoo. And so look at this. And I look and nothing is happening. Nothing happened for two months until finally it, that day came and uh, this little guy was born. And, oh, and... Uh, it was a great day for YouTube. Over a million people were watching. I think that's a little invasion of privacy myself, but uh, it was good for the zoo because the zoo signed an apparel deal with somebody. Also uh, got a deal with Toys R Us, a sponsorship, although Toys R Us went bankrupt, so I don't know if that was you know, part of the deal. And then they had a GoFundMe page that raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was a great, exciting event. Here's the problem. That little giraffe grows up to be. Yeah, well, here's the problem with that, is that in giraffe world, when Junior becomes an adolescent, he becomes a pain for the father. It's kind of that way in life, but, uh, and, and, but it's, it, he becomes competition for the father. And if they're out in the wild, here's what happens. Dad runs him off, okay? Dad just says, you're out of here. Don't come back, you know, have a good life. And so Junior goes, he hangs out with the fellas until he gets a girlfriend or two and then they repeat the process. And that's just nature, that's how it is. Here's the problem, when it's in captivity, then daddy can't run him off, so what does daddy do? Daddy kills him, okay? And so zoos are faced with a dilemma. When it's a male that's born, which that little guy was a male that you were watching, what they have to do is they have to relocate or sterilize or euthanize Junior, raising all kinds of ethical problems. You can go on the internet and read all about that, it's fun. In nature, the abandonment of sons by father is all a healthy part of the process, okay? Just get out of here, go have your life, and it's gonna be good. Not so much with human beings, okay? Despite what you learn, in the Lion King, we are created differently than the animal kingdom. In fact, God has a lot to say about, about uh, how that works. Uh, in fact, Genesis 2 and verse 18, you guys are familiar with this. God creates Adam. It uh, looks like he needs a helper, uh, a, a mate. So uh, he, God runs all the animals by him. Uh, is there anything in there that looks good to you? Well, the aardvark's not bad, but the nose is gonna be a problem. And, and so, and, so, and so God says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make, there's nothing out here that, I'll make you something. And he makes Eve. I will make a helper suitable for him. And it's the first family, nuclear family. And families are so important in the whole, they're the building block of everything. Uh, in Psalm chapter 68, verse six, it says, God actually has an antidote to loneliness. He sets the lonely in families. That's, that's why the church is so important. Um, that's why small groups are so important. There are lonely people here, lonely people at the campuses, uh, online. Um, and, and God's antidote is, let's get in a family because the family is where it happens. The family is where uh, formation goes and where relationship happens. And so he, he sets them in small groups in, in, the, in, the, in the family. So there are, there's all kinds of scripture. Uh, fathers were created to have an important lifelong role in the life of his children. They nurture, they care, they guide, they teach, they protect. There are scriptures throughout the Old Testament, New Testament with instructions for fathers. Now, when dad's not around, studies tell us that it tilts the odds uh, critically against uh, the children. In fact, studies tell us that nearly 75% of fatherless American children will experience poverty before the age of 11, compared to 20% of those raised by two parents. In fact, fatherlessness is the number one cause 
of poverty in America. You want to deal with poverty. There's a lot of things that need to be done. One of the crucial things is deal with father issues. Um, children living in the homes where fathers are absent are far more likely to be expelled from school. They're also more likely to drop out of school, develop emotional or behavioral problems, commit suicide, fall victim to child abuse and neglect. Fatherless males are far more likely to become violent criminals. Fatherless males represent 70% of the prison population serving long-term sentences. After I, I preached this message last night, oh, one of my friends came up to me who's been, who, who was at the church before we started. We made phone calls before we started Seacoast Church called 16,000 Homes over here and told him about the church. He was one of the ones that made phone calls and, and he went on to have a prison ministry and his ministry was specifically to death row inmates in South Carolina. And so he was telling me a story. He said, uh, at one point, I had six death row inmates. And he said, I asked each one of them individually. I said, what do you think is the biggest factor on you being here? He said, you know, at six years old, you didn't wake up with a dream to be on death row in a prison in South Carolina. He said, each one of them gave the same answer independently of each other. So there wasn't a man in my, my life. There wasn't a father. And it's a, it's, a, it's a common thing. We need prison reform, I believe. We need criminal reform in laws, but we also need to deal with the fatherless issue. That's at the core of everything. In fact, the fatherless generation of orphans goes through years early in life feeling neglected and devoid of meaning. In our communities, our churches, it's an issue. If we're gonna turn the tide, we've gotta address the problem. And so how? And that's why I'm here. <laughs> going to do a message. And guys, relax just a little bit, okay? Let me, let me tell you two things. Well, let me tell you what the message is from. We're doing a, a, a series. What's it called? <laughs> uh, summer reading. That's it. <laughs> summer reading. And what we're doing is the speaker each week kind of takes a book that they're reading that's impacted their life and, uh, and gives some principles around that a little bit. And uh, this week, the book that I'm doing uh, is called Fathered by God by John Eldridge. Anybody read that? Anybody read that? I know on the men's hike we do some. I would recommend this book to every man. Mamas, wives, daughters, sons, get it, get it for your dad, get it for your boys. It, it's, it's probably the best book I've ever read on men issues and it's, it's just really good. And uh, so I, I'm gonna use that just, just a little bit. Now, let me tell you, Two things about the message. Number one, guys, I'm not gonna beat you up. We all have those fears. Well, listen, men, we, we, guys, ladies, you don't know this, we feel like failures inside at the marriage thing and at the daddy thing and all of those things. Women, let me tell you something. It's hard to be a man. It really is. You couldn't be one, okay? It is hard. <laughs> Trust me. It is hard to be a man. I mean, men are at the brunt of jokes. You know, it's okay, you know, to talk about, you know, how clueless men are and all that. It's hard. It is really hard. Your pastor's not gonna beat you up today. Uh, so just relax. We're gonna enjoy this and, and uh, we're gonna get some good tips, I think. And secondly, we're not gonna fill in all the blanks today, okay? We just had much more inspiration than what we have time for. Some of you, that, that will be the most critical thing of the day. You're gonna walk out of here and not all the blanks are gonna be filled in the outline sheet, okay? Trust me, it's okay. Just pray, ask the Lord to give you a word. Whatever it is, it'll be fine. <laughs> but uh, we're not gonna get to all of them. But we'll get to the important ones, all right? So let's talk about what we wanna do. We wanna talk about reversing the curse of fatherlessness. How do we address what I think is the biggest issue in, in, in America today? How do we deal with it? Let me give you three ideas. Number one is dedicate yourself to becoming a good father. Let's just get good at this, guys. I mean, nobody's gonna be perfect. We all make mistakes. But just decide, you know what? It's so crucial. If you're a dad, uh, you know, you've got a life expectancy of about 80 years, give or take a few here in America. And it's gonna be 18 years. Maybe if you have three kids, it'll be 20 to 25 years that you dedicate to becoming the best that you can be, not compared to somebody else. Let's just, let's just get better. Let's just do as good a job as we can. Here's a scripture on it. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. How many of you have done that? Okay, rest of you are liars. 
okay? <laughs> Ask your family. We just default to some crazy stuff, you know, and, and uh, we call it being hangry, you know, when you're hungry and angry at the time, same time, or whatever it happens to be. We all violate, let's just admit it, we're all sinners, okay? We all violate it. But we need to learn how to bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, I'm just gonna say up front, sometimes it doesn't matter how hard you try, they just don't turn out right. Uh, we, um, <laughs> we went on a fishing trip this week. Uh, one of our uh, missions partners, One Hope, uh, which they're the ones that do the Bible app for kids and a whole lot of other things. They're just phenomenal. And we support them every, every you know, month with missions money and dollars and projects and all that. Well, they invited me to come down to what they call the Mahi Massacre in the Keys. I mean, how can you not do that? And uh, they said, well, make it kind of a father. So you can bring two, two, two of your kids with you, J Josh and Jason. We have relationships with them. So we snuck in Miles for his first, kind of my 10-year-old grandson for his first kind of men's deal. And, um, and so we went down. We, during the day, we'd fish for Mahi. It was a lot of fun. At night, Jason said, he, Jason always does research. And he had researched that there was a little place there that you could go and hand feed tarpon. Do you know what tarpon are? Tarpon are these great big fish and you could take little fish and so let's go do that. Well, it didn't sound like a good idea to me, but I thought, well, let's do it. You know, it's just us. And so we went down there and, and, uh, and so they, they got in a little argument about how you should do it. Jason felt like you just drop them. Josh says, no, you put it right down by the water. He said, tarpon will come and eat out of your hands. We said, well, fish in salt water all have teeth. We know that. We're not doing that. Josh said, don't worry about it. Tarpon don't have teeth. Okay. Jason, being wise, and now being shamed by his brother, Josh, your lead pastor. So he's going to get right down there and prove a point. They got sharp gums. <laughs> so guys, do what you can, but sometimes, you know what? It just happens. So what do kids need from dads? Well, what's our role? What do we do? You know, I like to look to scripture for that. And there's great example of what a dad, dad should be. And you, you look at the Bible guys, not a lot of them were really good at family and dad. You've almost got to look at Father God himself and his relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And so, and so uh, that your kids need the same thing that Jesus needed from his dad. Uh, it starts with the baptism of Jesus. Remember that story? Jesus is getting ready to start ministry and he wants to be baptized. His cousin John the Baptist is baptizing a bunch of people. Jesus comes down to be baptized. John the Baptist says, uh, you should be baptizing me. He's about the only guy in the crowd that kind of knew who Jesus was and what he was gonna be. Jesus said, no, to fulfill prophecy, we need this to happen. And so Jesus is baptized, the clouds part and a dove comes down. Did that happen when you got baptized? Anybody here? <laughs> and then this happened. It says, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love and with him am well pleased. Now we're gonna learn some things from that, but this morning I was thinking about this. One of the key things about being a dad we can learn from God the Father is just to show up. See, God the Father showed up at the big events. I mean, what if, what if, what if the Father wasn't at Jesus' baptism? It was like, my bad. You know, I, I was solving world crisis over here and didn't have time for that. But no, he showed up. And dads, for us, that's, that's half the battle. It's just to show up. Just show up and play ball in the backyard. Show up to the games. Show up to the recitals. They're going to be excruciating at times. <laughs> Jessica was a clarinet player in middle school, and that's just, oh my God. You got to stay for the whole recital, and you want to leave when you're kids. It's just painful. Do it. Go be there, okay? It's your job. You don't have to like it. Just act like you do. Um, be there for the graduations and and the sports games. You know, the saddest things I hear, and it's from grown-up men who 
almost never get through it. When you talk about stuff, he said, my dad never came. My dad didn't come. My dad wasn't there. You know, and for some of us, it's really hard because there's divorce, you know? And I mean, our church reflects, you know, the, the society we live in. And some of you, you know, you're, it's complicated. But I would say, go the extra mile. My heroes are some dads that even move locations so that they can be close to their kids, so they can be there. I'm not saying you have to do that, but be there. Do the best you can. And moms, let me, let me say this. When the marriage doesn't work for whatever reason, don't make it hard on dad to be there. He may have been a lousy husband, but he can still be a good father, okay? So don't make it hard. Don't make it, make it easy for him to be there, okay? So God just showed up. And here's what he did when he showed up. He demonstrated three things. Number one is acceptance, acceptance. He said, this is my son. This is my son. You say, well, if my son was Jesus Christ, I could accept his behavior, but my son is not Jesus Christ, and his behavior is like way out there. Accept him. Learn the difference between approval and acceptance. You are always accepted. If there's a question of whether, you know, I've had people ask me over the years, should I go to the wedding? I don't approve. Nah, go to the wedding. Go to the wedding. Always go to the wedding. Acceptance. Accept. You don't have to approve. Now, when they get married, you better accept everybody, okay? Uh, right up to that moment, you argue as best as you can. But acceptance is so very important, okay? The second thing that uh, God the Father showed was affection. He said, this is my son whom what? Whom I love. I love. See, your kids need to hear, I love you from you. That's not going to be the same as mom. Moms go, oh, I love you. Embarrasses everybody. Okay, but that's what they do. It's good. They, they're affectionate. You, you do it, you know, smack them a little bit or uh, wrestle with them on the floor. You know, moms, when dad's wrestling with them on the floor and you're going, take it outside or he's being too rough. Understand this. There's a lot of study that says that's how a dad says I love you. And it also builds some things in the kids that if it's not there, it's, it's not a good thing for them. So let them beat on each other just a little bit in, in a good way, in a good way, okay? So tell them you love them. Here, here's another one is number three, affirmation. He says, this is my son, acceptance, whom I love, affection, and in him I am well pleased. Am well pleased. See, he hadn't done anything yet. <laughs> Jesus hadn't healed people. He hadn't, you know, done the Sermon on the Mount. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't done anything. And the Father says, man, am I pleased with him. So it's not about performance. It's just about being pleased with who they are. See, sons and daughters need acceptance. They need love and affection. They need to know that you're proud of them. In fact, John Eldridge in his book says, uh, without this bedrock of affirmation, this core of assurance, a man will move unsteadily through the rest of his life, trying to prove his worth and earn belovedness through performance or achievement or through sex or in a thousand other ways. I know guys like that. I know lots of guys like that who their daddy never, never affirmed them. Never, never, never said, you're, you're doing good. I am so proud of you. You know, I, uh, as you know, we plant churches. We started a church planting organization about 18 years ago called The Ark, 17, 18 years ago. And we've planted uh, almost 800 churches now. And so I get to go speak at, when I'm not speaking here, I'm usually speaking at an art church. And the other day I got to go to one that was a, one of the new ones, uh, about a year and a half old. They're doing great. Doing, they've, they've got more people in their church than we had at five years. And they always think, am I doing good enough? Do, am I, you know, and, uh, and, so I, and so I was there and I kind of saw something in this guy, great leadership, but I saw kind of a void. And I, I asked him a question. I said, uh, how's your relationship with your dad? And he said, uh, Funny you should ask, he said, my dad left the home at five years old and chose not to have a relationship with me. So I haven't had one. I said, well, what about your spiritual dads? And he said, that's interesting too. He said, um, he was a star in the denomination that he was rising up in. And, and uh, he went to the denominational leaders and, and said, we have a vision to plant a church. And it was gonna be a denominational church. And, 
And he said, they fired me that day. Now, how many of you know there's always more to the story? I don't know what it was. But his spiritual fathers walked away from him, and that's why he came as an orphan to Ark and planted a church. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you're his dad now. You, you need to correct. I corrected him on a couple of things in love. It's what dads do. They don't do it in love like mamas do. They tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little kid, listen, <clears throat> listen to me. I don't care whether you like me or not. I'm old enough that it doesn't matter anymore. But <clears throat> <clears throat> little kid goes to be a goalie in soccer, you know. And they, they, they ask him to be a goalie one week. And they score several goals on him. Next week, they don't ask him. Don't tell him anything about it. He's kind of down about it. Comes home. Mama says, buddy, what's wrong? Says, they didn't make me goalie. Oh, you're the best goalie in the world. You're awesome. <laughs> And, you know, kind of pats him on the back. A little bit later, if dad's around, if he shows up, ultimately the kid's gonna, out of the blue, you ever had these? Dad, why didn't they let me play? You know, you're talking about something else. Dad, why didn't they let me be the goalie? What does dad say? Son, what were you thinking out there? That was the worst job I've ever seen in my life. You cannot be a goalie and let all those, let's make a plan, buddy, let's make a plan. And uh, so anyway, that's how dads do. But, uh, and it's good, it's good. Where were we at? <laughs> I tell this guy I'm proud of him. Proud of him. We, you know, it, it, Ark, we planted almost 800 churches. I'd say 500 of them, the pastors have daddy issues. Either with their physical dad, their spiritual dads, they abandon them or whatever. And so what I do at the Ark conference is we'll have like 4,000 people and we're gonna do that here uh, in not this next year but the year after and we're gonna ask all of you to serve. Okay, so we need that. Just giving you a year and a half to prep for that. But anyway, so I'll walk around the crowd and every time I see one of our young pastors, I'll say, you know what, I wanna tell you something, I'm proud of you. And if I know their dad's gone, your daddy would have been proud of you. And they just, and they just follow me around like little puppies. You know? <laughs> because we need affirmation. Don't make your kids chase you for affirmation. You tell them, you're proud of them. You're proud of who they are what they're doing and who they're becoming, okay? So the next fill in the blanks we're not gonna do. They were Chris Hodges's anyway. I gave him credit. They weren't all that good. And uh, <laughs> he's the church, first church we planted. And they'll have about 50,000 people in church this weekend, and he is that good, but I don't have time. All right, here we go. So what if, what if you don't have a father? Your, your, your dad wasn't available or isn't available or whatever. Reversing the curse, borrow the wisdom of a spiritual father. Borrow the wisdom of a spiritual father. You know, uh, in the Bible, there's a, a character named Timothy, and he was a young pastor. And it tells us a little about, about his upbringing. Good home, mom was a believer, his grandma was a believer. They raised him with good character. And yet it doesn't talk about a dad anywhere. And theologians uh, believe that probably dad wasn't in the picture. Either he died early or maybe he abandoned the family or whatever. And uh, the Apostle Paul um, kind of adopts this kid as a spiritual father. Look what he does. He becomes a great leader in the church. And Paul writes a letter to the Corinthian church. And he says, for this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son. He's not the biological father. He's not even an adopted father. He's a spiritual father. He's taking this kid in. He says, my son, what? Whom I love and who is faithful in the Lord. Notice the pattern. It's the same thing as God the Father said about Jesus. My son, acceptance, whom I love. What's the other A word there? Affection. Affection. And then who is faithful, affirmation in the Lord. Does the same thing. Uh, here, Second Timothy, he writes a, a letter to him. He says to Timothy, my dear son, grace and mercy and peace from God. So he became a spiritual father. Timothy's mom and grandma did a great job in raising him, but they recognized and Paul recognized he still needed a father to teach him how to be a man. You're born a male. You need somebody to teach you how to be a man, and that's what fathers do. I got, a, uh, I got an email from a friend of mine this week. I asked him to tell me his story because I knew that there was some backstory to it. And I wanted him to come read it himself, but he said, you're the preacher, I just write, so uh, you do it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you just a little bit of his story. His name's Ray. 
He said, I remember vividly in late 2009, Pastor Greg announced in church one Sunday that they were looking for men who wanted to be mentors. The program named E3 was for a group of boys from the Dream Center in North Charleston who didn't have fathers and who were looking for a father figure in their lives. I instantly heard the Lord say, I want you to do this. I had thanked him all of my life for the gift of my father who had passed away two years earlier. I felt so blessed and fortunate to be given such a gift. My dad was my hero when I was a boy and, and my best friend and mentor as an adult. His passing left a deep void in my life and I knew that this would help to fill that void by giving the same gift to another young man not as fortunate. Shortly after, I had lunch with Pastor Sam Lesky to find out more about the program. And through that conversation, I told him I was hoping to mentor a young man in the 10 or 11 year uh, age range. This would put him between my nine-year-old son and my 12-year-old daughter. I wanted him to be able to relate to and feel comfortable with both of them. He said he uh, ha had just the kid and his name was Dylan. It was awkward at first for both of us, but for the next few years, Dylan became a part of our family. We did everything together. Baseball games, fairs, weekends away, barbecues, football, holidays, you name it, we've done it. Our goal as a family was to love Dylan right where he was. It's acceptance, regardless of the circumstances. Fortunately, he comes from a very wonderful family with a mother and brothers and sisters who love him and protect him. My goal as a mentor was to exemplify what being a godly man, a husband, and a father looks like that he might grow up and do the same. Then he says, I certainly, not perfect, haven't come close, we all fall short, but we're given God's endless grace. We've watched Dylan grow into an incredible young man who loves the Lord and serves in the children's ministry every weekend at the Dream Center. In fact, Dylan's probably watching right now, and uh, as he has for years. He's a permanent fixture at the church. Last weekend, we celebrated his graduation from Military Magnet Academy. I love that. It was an incredible to see the support and love that he had from people whose lives he had touched at the Dream Center and elsewhere. This fall, Dylan will be attending Trident Tech with a full scholarship to study aeronautical technology with the hopes of eventually working at Boeing. Do we have... You're cutting into my time with your applause. Do we have any Boeing hiring people? You need to hire this kid, okay? And, and we got a hundred others just like, you know, we, we mentor a hundred kids uh, every year at the Dream Center with the goal of them. Listen, the North Charleston High School, and the teachers are doing a great job. The principals are doing a great job. There are a lot of challenges there. And, uh, and, and their graduation rate has grown from like 36% a few years ago when we started program to about 50%. It's not our programs doing, it's a lot of, it's hard work by the teachers. But you know what? There are a lot of kids there that all they hear is what they can't be, what they can't do, and what they can't have in the neighborhoods. And the, and the examples, you know, are, are sometimes less than, than, than great. They got mamas and grandmas and, and family that just love these kids. And so we just jumped in and said, we're gonna be the voice of more. All we're gonna do is we're gonna hang out with them. Just be there, be the voice of more. And we do about 100 per year right now. School would love us to do more. And, um, and our graduation rate's like 87% of the kids and they're going on to get jobs and, and uh, do, doing what they need to do. But it's because people like you can, um, uh, uh, can jump in and I wasn't supposed to preach all that because I'm running out of time be more blanks that we don't get. Let me finish his letter. I can honestly say that although I miss my dad, the void left by his passing has been more than filled. God is able to do immeasurably more than all I ever expected or imagined. My wife and I now have three children. I have a daughter and two sons who I love very much. Dylan will be a part of my life until I leave this earth. And I can't wait to see what God has planned for him. I know it'll be an incredible and it's been an honor to be a part of the journey. What a great story. See, men, your influence can spread well beyond your home. You can be a part of solving the biggest crisis we face in our nation, the biggest crisis we face in our community, the biggest crisis we face in our church. Look what the scriptures say. John James 1 and verse 27 says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows. Now, the word orphan, we always think of, you know, well, that's somebody that doesn't have a father or mother. In the context of the Old Testament, that mainly referred, it did refer to that, but it mainly referred to fatherless families, okay? That's the widows and the orphans. 
And, and we can be a part of that. You know, it, uh, you, you can make a difference. It might look like volunteering to be an E3 mentor. And if you wanna do that, take your card out of your bulletin during your response time or do it now. Just put mentor on there and put your name. We need men and women. Uh, and, and you can do that. It might be leading a student small group or, or volunteering to be a part of um, just uh, Kids Coast. You know, we need more men who will be examples uh, in that area. Um, or it could be something as simple as just checking in on encouraging a boy or girl whose father's absent. They need, a, and they, they, they need acceptance and affection and affirmation. It could be with grown men like mine is, is just to find guys that have father issues and, and tell them you love them, tell them you're proud of them, tell them that you're, you're in their, their, their corner, see? So, so, so there's a lot we can do. So what if you don't have an attentive father and you haven't made connection with a spiritual father? I've got great news for you. Best part of the message, learn to receive from your heavenly father. Learn to receive from your heavenly father. Honestly, guys, this was a hard one for me. I grew up in a great home. My dad now lives with me. You know, he's 83, 84 years old, gonna have a birthday in just a few weeks. And uh, he's more spry than I am. I mean, he's a great guy. And when I was a kid, he was a good father. My early memories of dad are wrestling on the floor and taking me to football games. I remember I was a wrestler. And one time we had a massive snowstorm in Denver, had to go about 10, 15 miles to a match. And the bus almost didn't get there. And Dad always came. I knew he probably wouldn't that night because the roads were terrible. And just before my match, I see this guy in, in a hel motorcycle helmet. Why he drove my motorcycle, I think it's because his car wouldn't start. My motorcycle did. He drove 10, 15 miles through the snow to see his son wrestle. I mean, that's the kind of dad he was. Uh, but somehow, I didn't transfer his love and care to my heavenly father. I saw God as a father with standards that I just couldn't live up to. Felt like a failure most days. I saw him as stern, sometimes distant, waiting to catch me do something wrong. And I, as I think about it, it was part of it was my theology. Because my theology was that if I got caught doing something wrong while I was in the process of dying, and if I died in that state, I would be in hell forever and away from God. I, I don't believe that anymore. God is my father, he's forgiven my sin. I blow it, I confess my sin, but it's all covered in Jesus Christ. See, that's the kind of father that you can love. It's ready, I, I saw him as ready to pull out the belt. Do you remember that? Any of you raised in the 70s? You'd hear it go through the loops, and then they do a 70s version of a reminder, which today we call abuse, okay? But anyway, that's what I, that's what I saw as a heavenly father. And it wasn't until the last 10 years, the last 10 years, really meeting Chip Judd was a part of it for me, uh, that I began to learn to receive from my heavenly father. See, God promises to be a father to you. He says, I will be a father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He'll be to you what he was to Jesus. John Eldridge says this, he says, you are the son of a kind and daughter, I would say, strong and engaged father. A father wise enough to guide you in the way, generous enough to provide for your journey, offering to walk with you every step of the way. Here's the problem, we just don't believe it. We don't, it's hard for us. Our core assumptions about the world boil down to this, we're on our own. We gotta work hard, make life work. We're not really watched over. If we don't do it, it won't happen. We're not cared for. Many of us have called upon God as a father, but frankly, he doesn't seem to have heard, and we're not sure why. Maybe it's something that we did. We didn't do it right, or maybe he's about more important matters in the world, but we believe that we're fatherless. My favorite story in the, in the whole book was uh, Eldridge talks about encountering a grad school student that was a friend of his. This guy's in his fourth year of graduate school, gonna be a doctor, and and he just got married, and life is tough. It's just, they were talking about the pressures, and Eldridge wanted to kind of change the conversation a little bit. He said, Sam, the guy's name was Sam. He said, Sam, what brings you joy these days? What brings you joy? And right away, he began to talk about a kayak. He, he loved the water, and he said there was a kayak, a sea kayak, a little bit more expensive that he wanted, and, and, um, and, and he'd been saving his money for it, and it looked like that in just a couple, three months, he'd have enough to buy this kayak, and it just brought him a lot of joy, and then the guy stops. And he says, you know what? Something inside tells me that 
God is opposed to this. So Eldridge asked him why. And he said, I don't know. I guess it's hard for me to believe that God wants anything good for me. Eldridge went through with him and it had to do with father issues in his own life. But as I read that, I thought, I wonder how many guys have felt that. Have you ever felt that? Felt that like God's probably not that interested or even maybe opposed to what brings you joy. It might be the new kayak, the new boat, the new golf clubs. And here's what Eldridge said to him. He said, you know what? I'm excited about the kayak and I think God is excited too. When he said that, I was somewhere in the United States, I don't know where. I was in a hotel room reading that book and it just lit me up. I saw something I hadn't seen. God is excited about what brought him joy, is what he said. Now I know that you know, in my mind, God's excited when I read the Bible. God's excited when I give to missions or give to, you know, a building program for the future and all that kind of, but God's excited about what brings me joy. Let me tell you what brings me joy. Music brings me joy. It really does. I love sitting around playing a guitar, and I had been stalking a guitar for months. I'd go to a city, and I'd always go to the guitar store, and I'd play one of these. Right here's a nice little guitar. And, uh, and I was thinking about buying it, but I thought, well, you know, bills are paid and I'm honoring God, but it's kind of a, I don't know. But can I tell you guys, if you buy your own Father's Day gift, you will never, ever be disappointed. You won't get, <laughs> you won't get a piece of, uh, some socks or a t-shirt or whatever. And the thought came to me, God's excited about what I'm excited about. I called my wife. I said, God wants me to buy that guitar. <laughs> and Debbie has a little harder time hearing God than I do. <laughs> but I bought that guitar. I love it. I'm, I'm not gonna do it. But anyway, uh, so here's what I, sometime, we're five minutes over right now. We can't do it. Um, I hang that guitar on my wall. It's, it's not my only guitar. I, do have five other ones, but I needed this one. <laughs> there, none of them are nice like this. All of them were like bargains. This wasn't. This was just a nice guitar. And, uh, and so I hang them on my wall. And here's, this is honest, guys. I'm just being real with you here. I walk into my office and I see that guitar and I think about the love of God. I really do. And God's excited about that. And God wants you to experience this. It might not be a kayak or a guitar, you know. Some of you are a little more high maintenance than that. Or it, 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 it might be the death of a child or a dream or a life that feels mostly hard and disappointed. We feel alone. George McDonald said this, the hardest, gladdest thing in the world is to cry Father from a full heart. The refusal to look up to God as our Father is the one central wrong in the whole human affair. That's why we gotta get this right. Before we solve any other problems, we gotta get this right. The inability, the one central misery. See, no wonder Jesus in his teaching keeps coming back to scriptures like this. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? No hands. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? He looks around his disciples. Nobody raises their hands. And so he says, if you then are, who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Say that together. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Obvious answer is yes. What do you think? If a man owns 100 sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 90 and nine in the hills, go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, tr truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 90 and nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that one of these little ones would perish. Here's the truth, guys. You have a good, good Father. That's who he is. See, he's better than you thought. He cares more than you know. He's kind, he's generous, he's out for your best. And this is absolutely central in the teaching of Jesus. And I can't tell you how it changed my life. 
when I began to see that over and over. I'm one of these guys that wakes up grumpy in the morning. Do you? I, I'm foul every morning. It's just like, oh my God, it's morning. You know, that's just natural for me. I inherited it from somebody. These days, for about the last 10 years, every morning my first thought is, I have a, or I, I've disciplined myself to my first thought is, I have a Father God who is crazy about me. He's got a great day planned for me. He's got a future that's beyond what I can ask or imagine. God loves you guys. God loves you. You know what? Innately, we, we, we all kind of know that, um, that we have forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. Well, we, we, we know that. You come to church and you get it. But there's more. That forgiveness was made available to us so that we could come home to the Father. It's so that we could have peace with God. We could come home to the Father. Forgiveness isn't the goal. Coming home to the Father is the goal. And I want you, men, women, sons, daughters, I want you to experience coming home to the Father today. Would you bow your heads? Would you bow your heads? Here and in the campuses, in the chapel, wherever you happen to be, just bow your head. Many of us, campus pastors are coming forward. Many of us, many of us feel distant from God right now. Some of us have always felt distant from God and it's because we are. Maybe you've kind of been doing your own thing, feeling like you were on your own. If it is to be, it's gonna be me. And today I wanna invite you to come home to the Father. Some of you feel distant from God because you've just kind of wondered, your path has kind of gone a different direction. It might be because of something that happened or just life. And I wanna offer you today to come home to Father. If you feel distant from God right now, would you just look up at me or look up at your campus pastor? Because I wanna pray, pray, pray with you. Looking throughout the congregation, just look up at me, okay? Make some eye contact, all right, all over this place. Let's make eye contact. I, I feel distant from God. I wanna come home to the Father, okay? Awesome, lots of guys. Awesome, 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 awesome. Awesome. I wanna come home to the Father. I wanna come home to the Father. And the campuses, you be looking up to your campus pastors in the front right now. Balcony, I wanna come home to the Father. I wanna come home to the Father. I wanna experience the Father's love. I wanna pray for you. God, I thank you right now. I thank you that you designed this moment. You ordained that each of us would be here right now. That we would be quiet enough to hear you say, I accept you. I love you. I'm proud of you. God, we recognize our own sinfulness. We're thankful for Jesus Christ who died so that we could have peace with you so that we could come home to the Father. So we affirm that. Just affirm that in your own heart. God, I'm coming home to you right now. Just tell him that. I'm coming home to you right now. God, seal this by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.